Thank you. I'm sorry if I put that song in anyone's head. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, my name's Helen Johnston. I'm a community archaeologist with the Thames Discovery Programme. Um, we're um, this is a picture of our volunteers working on the foreshore uh, at Rotherhithe in South East London. So the person was asking about where's the heritage in London. Um, we are a project that's been going for ten years now. Next year's our tenth anniversary. This year, exciting. Um, we originally were funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund for three years up until, so we started in 2008 until 2011. Um, and then ever since then we've been hosted by the Museum of London Archaeology, MOLA. Um, and we currently have um, some funding from a couple of other places as well at the moment. Um, our, my post is supported by the City Bridge Trust, um, specifically to engage with older Londoners and the archaeology on the Thames. Um, and we also get funding from Tideway, which is the Thames Super Sewer Project. And they fund my colleague Josh, um, who's working with young people and doing community engagement and outreach as well. Um, so what do we do as a, ooh, uh, we, as a project? Um, we have um, a big element of what we do is working with volunteers. We train volunteers to monitor and record the foreshore archaeology that you find in London. We work... Um, all across Greater London where the Thames is tidal, so that's from Richmond in West London all the way through to Erith near the Dartford Crossing in um, South East London. Um, we do a programme of fieldwork every year. We visit about six to seven, eight sites um, during the summer. We'll spend once a month, we'll go down for five, six days to a specific site and um, record the archaeology there. And our volunteers are out regularly monitoring sites across the river as well. Um, we also do a lot of public outreach, so we do lots of regular guided walks along the river and onto the foreshore. We do a programme of talks and lectures um, about aspects of the Thames archaeology, um, and we also run workshops on practical skills and things that interest. So most recently, a couple of weeks ago, we did a flint workshop where everyone got to do some flint mapping. Um, and we also do a lot of digital <coughs> outreach, so do look us up on Facebook and Twitter and We've got a great web page. It's a little bit um, looks a little bit dated, but it's got packed full of information as well. Um, so in ten years, what have we achieved? Um, we've trained um, over six hundred and seventy-five people now um, as frogs, which is what we call our volunteers. So if I slip to talking about frogs, I'm talking about <coughs> volunteers. <laughs> it stands for Foreshore Recording and Observation Group members. Um, we've recorded over a thousand features on the Thames Foreshore. Um, we've organised well over, this is actually last year's figures, so these are out of date, we've organised well over 250 events. We reach thousands of people across London every year through our outreach. Um, we've won two British Archaeological Awards, including Best Community Project, um, and we've had over 600,000 views of our webpage. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is a little bit about volunteering and well-being, um, and exploring a little bit about the evidence there is for the relationship with that, um, and then also the relationship with being on the foreshore for our volunteers and, um, and their sense of well-being around that, and then what that might mean for the projects that we do in archaeology where we're reaching out to the community and involving volunteers. Um, so, volunteering and well-being. It's a bit of the new hotness at the moment, so hot it actually made a Vice webpage um, a couple of weeks ago, volunteering is the best kept secret for mental health. Um, there has been quite a lot of research and studies done to try and explore this relationship. And I thought I'd just pull out a few recent ones that have been done um, specifically about um, volunteering and well-being. Um, so this first one's a report that was commissioned by um, WRVS, which was then known as the Women's Royal Voluntary Service, they're now just the Royal Voluntary Service, um, which is looking at the relationship between um, volunteering in later life. Um, and they were, this is a longitudinal study, and I've tried to pick out the ones that are longitudinal studies. And this used the data from the English Longitudinal Study of Ageing um, and examined changes in well-being for volunteers over a two-year period. Um, and what it found was that for each of the well-being outcomes that they considered on this project, um, volunteers compared to non-volunteers um, had an improvement in their well-being in all of those outcomes. Um, on its own, the longitudinal nature of this analysis and adjustments for a range of potential alternative explanatory factors provide strong evidence for a causal interpretation that volunteering does improve well-being. Um, the next study, this is um, this was funded by um, the Economic and Social Research Council for the um, Office of the Third Sector in 2016. Again, it's a longitudinal study, 
a life course analysis, um, and they used the general health questionnaire from the British Household Panel Survey, um, which has data from 1996 to 2008. Um, and again, they were looking at the relationship between volunteering and mental well-being um, across the life course. And what they found in this study, which is quite interesting, was that um, it actually varies in your, the relationship between well-being and your mental health um, and mental well-being um, changes um, do, is, is not all the same all the way across your life, of course, and actually it really impacts when you reach 40 and go into the older age. Um, and there was a real um, evidence in that study that shows from 40 onwards, volunteering does help your um, mental well-being. Um, we're not considering age, but even so, we're not considering age, those who engage in volunteering regularly appear to experience higher levels of mental well-being than those who never volunteered. Um, and finally, this is um, the Age UK's Index of Wellbeing in Later Life, um, which is, again used data from the Understanding Society Survey and the English Longitudinal Study of Ageing. Um, they weren't specifically looking at volunteering in this study, and they didn't identify volunteering specifically in the data that they were looking at. But I thought it was interesting and significant for archaeology um, and the kind of work that we do with people in archaeology, because um, they found that social and civic participation and creative and cultural participation um, are the all-important indicators, um, making up um, almost an eighth of the total well-being in later life. Um, I think um, there's a little bit of caution that needs to be used. I think it's really tempting. You're writing a funding bid and you're like, yeah, 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 we'll improve our being as well. Let's chuck that in there. Um, but all of these studies identify that there are other factors in people's lives that mean that they have an increased level of well-being when they're volunteering. Pe people who volunteer, volunteering is a, um, coming from a position of privilege to be able to have the time and the resources and the space in your life to be able to volunteer. For a lot of people, it's a quite privileged position, and volunteers generally have a high level of income, they're generally more likely to be in employment, um, have less health problems and disabilities, and so on. Um, but a lot of these studies, um, both the Nazaru and Matthew study and the Tabison, Mohan and Smith analysis, and I'm no statistician, so I'm going to trust them on this. If somebody else wants to pick apart their stats, they can. Um, they say that even adjusting for these other factors in people's lives, volunteering still shows um, an impact on people's, a, a positive impact on people's well-being. So I think that altogether shows that, yes, volunteering can improve your well-being. Um, and this has led to... Um, a lot of um, interest in volunteering as something to support people with their mental health um, and physical health as well. So this is from the NHS um, webpage and they've got a whole section on there about giving for well-being and getting involved in volunteering as a, a way to um, improve your mental well-being. Um, there's, it's also been increasingly seen as an option for initiatives such as social prescribing, which is where healthcare professionals um, refer people to local non-clinical um, projects rather than looking at medical um, interventions. Um, and again, this is something you've been mentioning earlier a little bit. Um, and it's an area, social prescribing is an area that a lot of um, community organisations, museums are looking at as options as a way to engage with people and perhaps bring further benefits to the work that they're doing. Um, and just an example, this is an example from the museum sector, which some of you may well have heard about. It's the Inspiring Futures project that the um, Imperial War Museum North and Manchester Museum have been running. Um, and they've just published their evaluation report, or just it was last year, um, which showed, and they were deliberately targeting groups who have a lower sense of well-being. Um, and what they found, of, um, and getting those people involved in volunteering at museums across Manchester, um, and it was a three-year project, and what they found over the three years was that um, people's sense of well-being went from below the average, national average, across all the indicators that they were looking at, um, to into the national average, um, which is really significant. Um, before participating in the project, participants' levels of well-being were significantly below the national average. On completion of the training and placement programme, participation well-being increases on par with the national average. So it demonstrates that there's definitely, and I think some of the projects we've already heard about today do the same thing, targeted intervention with groups with a low sense of well-being can definitely have an impact. 
Okay. So, um, what about the Thames Foreshore? Um, we're a very privileged <coughs> in our project. Um, we get to see the city from a very different point of view. Um, we get to a very different perspective on some things that might be very familiar. Um, we, the foreshore is often seen as a place that you can't access um, unless you've got permission, which is not actually the case. Most of it is publicly accessible, um, but um, it's just not known about, even though it's right in the centre of the city often. It's a place that you know people see every day. Um, but even the places that are restricted, so the tower, this is in front of the Tower of London, and it is a restricted foreshore, but um, our project does get permission to go down there and to do public outreach right down there and to do field work <coughs> down there, which is quite a privilege as well. Uh, we get to go to places in London that you might not associate with being in London and, and being in the centre of a big city. Um, and despite being in the centre of the city, um, it can be a very dangerous and dirty place. Um, it's almost a, a liminal space, almost it probably is a liminal space. It's, it's not urban, but it's not wild either. This, most of the foreshore is being constructed by people living in London. It's not a, a natural environment at all. Um, it's not always pretty or beautiful. Um, and we're not, not always working in the shadow of iconic landscapes. Um, but it's almost always atmospheric. Um, so, one thing that's come up consistently on our evaluation and just generally <coughs> talking with our volunteers um, is the um, sense of increased well-being that our volunteers have from being involved with, their, um, with the project. And this is <coughs> often self-reported. We, you know, we're maybe not specifically looking for this when we're doing this evaluation work with them, but it's something that the volunteers themselves um, give to us when we're doing it. Nothing to do with the job, but my balance was shot. Paddling around in the mud has improved at no end. The physio is delighted. I've benefited personally in many ways. My energy has been higher, and the Frog TDP initiative has motivated me and inspired me. And this relates to increase in self-esteem and confidence and general health. Social benefits of working with others who share a common interest. Back to you. Sorry, this is from our um, evaluation that was done at the end of the HLF project um, in 2011. <coughs> 2011. Um, but it's something that we've um, continued to see and um, was explored further by one of our <coughs> volunteers for her master's dissertation last week year, which she, she called Is Being a Frog Good For You? And this is by Sally. <coughs> <coughs> and, um, she was specifically looking at whether there was benefits for older people volunteering in the project. And she used the um, national, um, New Economics Foundations, um, they have five indicators of well-being. And she was um, using that model to explore um, well-being, sense of well-being amongst our volunteers. And she used surveys and in-depth questions, um, in-depth interviews with our volunteers. And what she found was that across all of the um, um, five ways of um, well-being, um, our volunteers report at all ages as well, report an increased sense of well-being. And there is some difference between old volunteers and younger volunteers. But the important thing to take away is that, yes, our volunteers do report that volunteering with us does seem to benefit them. And again, and this is just bringing us back to this whole thing about therapeutic landscapes, um, the volunteers, Sally didn't specifically ask them about the river and the relationship with the foreshore, but it came up in the interviews and it came up in the freeform responses on her surveys. I find the river therapeutic as an important part of my well-being and want to learn more about it and give something back. I've always loved beach combing and shores of any kind and I'm sure that without this aspect of being a frog I would have opted for a more land-based activity. It's lovely and I sit there sometimes and you could be anywhere. It's definitely the Thames. It makes me feel very London. I don't quite know what that means but <laughs> it sounds good. Um, and these are really common ex um, responses. It's something that we get um, anecdotally all the time from the volunteers. It comes up when we do if, like feedback and stuff at the end of workshops and things like that as well, which is fantastic. Um, so, 
what potentially does this mean for the kind of work that we do in archaeology? And first of all, we need more data. The, um, and this is something Sally highlighted in her dissertation as well. Um, there is obviously a relationship between volunteering in archaeology projects and well-being. Um, we need to understand that better. Um, as particularly longitudinal studies, over time, how does it change and how does people's relationship with the archaeology and with the project change over time? Um, and we need to get better at doing impact measurement and, and developing our own impact measurement tools, I think. A lot of times the data is done is dictated to us by the funders, which is understandable, they're the people paying us. Um, but like, let's, let's have, think about the social return on investment. We know our projects are having an impact, let, you know, we're very good about doing the, the output, so we've written this report and we've done this and we've done that and recorded this and recorded that. But like, what's the other value that our projects are generating and bringing? And how do we measure that and record that? And it's kind of related to the gentleman who's talking about how do we talk to the government in their own language? Well, you know, let's do that, but let's also develop some of our own language as well so that we can use that. Um, the role of historic places um, and people's relationship with um, the historic landscape, I think, is really important. Um, and thinking about people's motivations for why they get involved, and this is, again, relating to some of the earlier discussions we've had today. Why do people get involved in the first place, and what, why do they continue to stay involved? Um, and thinking about their emotional relationship that they have with places. Um, there was a really interesting piece of research that the National Trust Commission from De Montford University a couple of years ago about the differences between managing volunteers and managing staff. Um, and one of the key things that they highlighted in that difference is the emotional labour that's involved in um, managing volunteers. Um, and it's come up in, like, in our discussions this morning particularly. It's things like um, when, you have, um, when you manage volunteers, you don't have an employment contract. You have, don't have any kind of um, thing to hold over them. So you have that emotional relationship instead with them. Um, so how do we make sure that when we're developing our projects, we're taking that into account and planning for that? Um, and one of the things that the National Trust Research identified is that volunteers generally for the National Trust, and I think this applies with archaeology, have a very strong relationship with the place where they're volunteering. The organisation is less of an interest for them. And a lot of the sources for tension between staff and volunteers was when they volunteers didn't feel that the staff shared that same emotional relationship. Um, and I think that's the kind of very interesting and um, insight that is something that we might want to be considering in the way that we run our projects and talk about what we do. Um, and finally, there's a lot of value in doing targeted work, and it's been really heartening already today to hear about projects that people we're reaching out to those groups that um, have a low sense of well-being, and how do we get them involved in our projects? And also really thinking about the barriers to involvement as well, um, and how do we make sure that the process is as smooth and as easy as possible. Um, and there's loads of potential there. Like I say, this is the new hotness. Um, so, like, can we tap into some of that? There's funding out there. There's, you know, networks and resources available to do this. It's, um, the museum sector has started to embrace it. It's been um, very common in the environmental conservation volunteering sector now, there's loads and loads and loads of projects where they're working with refugees, with people with mental health problems and stuff like that. We could be doing more of this in archaeology as well. So, yeah, thank you very much.